please welcome doctors Jason and Kelly Nichols. Thank you for those very kind words. And we are looking forward to telling you what, what we've been through, I think, as you said, in the last so many years, you know, a couple of years. All right, I'm just going to actually kick us off um, very briefly. And thank you. It's so wonderful to be back and to see all of your smiling faces. Well, you're not smiling right now, but some of you can make you smile. Everyone smile. There we go. Um, it's a it's a pleasure to be in this building. It looks a lot different. The whole campus looks so much different. And that's all because of the people who are here who make those changes and do great things. So we really appreciate being invited here today to talk to you about tears and dry eye. And that doesn't work. There we go. So we prepared this lecture. We know it's not CE. Jason is not gonna be talking about any products, but I am. So uh, fair, fair closure, disclosure on that. Um, we have had the opportunity to work with lots of companies with having NIH grants as our current current funding, um, and of course you'll hear a bit about our funding over the years. And we do want to thank you again for inviting us here. There's, I guess if you call us, we each get a half of this award. So we're like the 16th or 17th or the 16th and a half of this award. But anyway, you look at it, the list is wonderful. Um, there's really some giants on this, lot, all giants on this list of people, and it's an incredible honor to follow in these footsteps. I do want to give, I guess, a little shout out to Jerry Westheimer because he turns 100. He's turning 100 or maybe just turned 100. And 10 years ago, I mean, 100, that's worth smiling about, right? Yeah, absolutely. And from what I understand, he endowed this lectureship when after he came here and was awarded the same thing 10 years ago. So what an honor to follow in his footsteps. And if only we all think we might want to live to 100, but if we do live to 100, we want to live to 100 like he's living 100. So he's pretty amazing. So thank you for recognizing us and recognizing him as well as all the others that have won this award. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jason, who's going to take you through some of his story, and then I'll have a story after that so we don't have to do a mic pass back and forth. As Kelly said, thank you so much um, for the award. We're, we're both honored tremendously, and it's incredible to be back uh, in this house that you built. It's beautiful, and I congratulate the leadership all the way around. Uh, it's remarkable the changes that have been made. Um, and we appreciate it very, very much in the hospitality that the Dean's office has showed us. What am I pushing to go forward? I'll continue the role of thank yous. So many people to thank, teachers and classmates, optometry students, graduate students, postdocs, mentors, colleagues, institutions, my friends at Contact Lens Spectrum, our funding agencies, the list goes on and on. Too many people to name. I in particular want to thank a few people who I call are my coaches. And I think it was said one time, I'm not sure who said it, that a good coach can impact a game, a great coach can impact a life. And I've had several great coaches that have impacted my life. And three or four or five of them are here at Ohio State or have been at Ohio State. And I'm tremendously grateful for all that you invested in me. Mm -hmm. I think it paid off. Uh, a couple others as well. And then I wanna thank my team. You can see my team, Kelly, our parents, our sons, um, both at the University of Utah now, and uh, I couldn't do it without you, so thank you for everything you did to support me. I'm going to use this as an opportunity to reminisce in a way, although I will talk about some current research activities, but I want to reminisce because I would say that the time I spent at Ohio State from 1995 to 2011 was not just formative for me, but it was transformative in my career, and so I really like to think about this time the research that we did here uh, and the impact that it's had. Um, and so I'll start kind of at the beginning. It started in, uh, I'd say 1997, the summer of 1997, T35, summer research projects. And the idea of, of ortho K kind of came back on the table for a couple of reasons. It had been popular a couple of decades before. There were new lens materials on the market, new designs, this um, reverse geometry design kind of made it relevant at the time. And so um, myself, along with our mentors, Joe Barr and Mark Bullimore, Matt Marsich, who was a classmate of mine, Mihan Nguyen, a T35 student, were able to do a study that had tremendous impact. In fact, it was the first study I published. This was 2000 in OVS, so we did the work a few years earlier. But it was so impactful that it led to a letter to the editor for the first paper that I ever published from none other than Nathan Efren, who says, 
Orthokeratology is an emotive topic. In response to the recently published paper, Overnight Orthokeratology by Nichols et al., orthokeratology enthusiasts worldwide have thrown up their hands in glee and declared that this paper proves that orthokeratology is an effective means of temporary, temporarily reducing myopia. It's quite impactful to have Nathan Efren write a letter to the editor in your first paper, but it was a learning experience. So at the very next academy meeting, I decided to myself, I'm just going to go up and introduce myself to him. I did, and he was a little bit stunned, but I would say that that was the blossoming sort of a lifelong or career-long relationship that I've had with Nathan, who's also been very impactful in my career. So another contemporary topic at the time, this is a sort of the late 90s again, was that extended wear had come back on the table, contact lenses, overnight wear of contact lenses. So in the 80s, there was a lot of hype about extended wear, a lot of press about um, infection with overnight wear of lenses. But again, new materials, new designs. It was an exciting time in cornea and contact lenses, the late 90s, early 2000s. And so for a master's project that I did with Dr. Zadnik, um, we looked at sort of comparing daily disposables, which were also new on the market, relatively new at the time, to extended wear, sort of a head-to-head, -head, month to month clinical trial comparison. At the end, subjects were asked, which lenses did you prefer? Which modality did you prefer? And by far, they preferred overnight extended wear, which was really interesting. I think timely at the, at the time, or timely at the time. Uh, so, so from that, we said, well, why is that? We, we knew that they were telling us it was about convenience, but were there other factors? And another, um, another area of research at the time that was happening was the so-called quality of life research. Um, refractive error specific quality of life, disease specific quality of life. And so in the context of that study, we looked at quality of life, refractive error specific quality of life, and we said, could we sort of understand why patients had such a strong preference for wearing their lenses in terms of the visual impact they, they had in their lives or convenience and other factors? And it turns out that the instrument showed no differences between the two modalities. And so we did some other analyses and said, well, is it an effective instrument or not? And came to the conclusion Maybe you need really large sample sizes to use this instrument. So we published this paper in ophthalmology, I guess in June, 2001. The second paper I published received a letter to the editor from this time Oliver Shine uh, at the Johns Hopkins University. And it starts out by saying, with what apparent confidence do Nichols et al call into question the usefulness of the RSVP questionnaire? So I was a little bit shocked at this stage, not sure about this academia thing, but I decided to press ahead. So again, sort of around the millennium, the, as I mentioned, new materials and designs of lenses were coming out. And this uh, material, silicon hydrogels, new to the marketplace about 1999, 2000. Joe Barr wrote an editorial heading into the new millennium with a new material. But with the new materials, we were seeing unusual complications that we hadn't seen with soft lenses before. They were high modulus materials, um, which means they didn't stretch very well. Um, they were, we were seeing issues um, reported about tear exchange from behind the contact lens. We were seeing an increase in infiltrates and the so-called mucin balls, which were phenomenon that were occurring behind the contact lens. And so it got us thinking, what's going on behind the contact lens? The late 1990s, Ewan Kingsmith and several from Ohio State, Kelly, Nick Fote, Dick Hill, Barbara Fink, had developed a system to, to measure the thickness of the tears in vivo. Uh, and so precorneal tear film structure, this basics, but if you have your epithelium, it's two models. So you have an outer lipid layer and then an aqueous layer up against the hydrophobic epithelium of the cornea. And Ewan and team had started to study this here. And they had had some publications, I think in the late 90s, kind of um, on the development of the interferometry system and the application of it. And so I went to Ewan and I said, Ewan, there's this contact lens, a contact lens, it'd be really interesting to see if we could measure what happens around contact lens. And he hummed and hawed and this sort of thing. And so I convinced him, like we sort of looked at what it might be the case is sort of what happens when you put a contact lens on the eye, how does it sort of divide the tear film and what happens in so-called a pre-lens tear film, which is anterior to the contact lens and a post-lens tear film, which is between the posterior lens and the epithelium. And this was just our guess at the time. We didn't know what the thicknesses would be. We didn't know if we could measure them. A group at Berkeley decided to try and measure this indirectly using an optical pachymeter and sort of subtracting off and came to a rather large estimate, which surprised people. But we did it. We were able to measure pre and post lens tear film and sort of develop the initial understandings of what's going on behind the contact lens. 
fact, I think this is one of my first posters or second posters um, with you and where we had shown that we could measure these layers at the AAO 2001. Thank you, Wendy Clark, for helping with that. Thank you, Mike, for reminding me of her last name. <laughs> So we did, and this set off a series of studies that we had done. So not only could we measure the thickness just in a point behind the lens or in front of the contact lens, we started doing things like, well, what happens when you close your eyes to simulate sleep? Can you, do you even have a post-lens tear film after that? And so we really started to do lots of studies looking at the dynamics uh, around a contact lens and, and otherwise. And I thank Ewan for all of his mentorship and influence in my career as well. So not only could we measure a specific thickness at a specific location, we could measure it over the course of the time. So if you think about the interblink interval, you hold your eyes open for four or five, six seconds or 40 or 50 seconds if you're Nick Fote. <laughs> right? Yeah. I think it was even longer than that. Six minutes. There you go. So you can measure what happens during the interblink interval as the tears decay. So we could measure, as you can see here, the precorneal tear film thinning rate and the pre-lens tear film thinning rate. For some reason, the pre-lens tear film thinning rate always is faster. And that was one of the sort of mysteries of studies that we tried to address in, in the future. But when you plot these values out, you can see for the precorneal tear film here, the pre-lens tear film here, you see these bimodal distributions start, start to occur. And when you see that, uh, those bimodal distributions or more than one mode of distribution, you might ask yourself, maybe there's one mechanism that's driving what's happening behind the data that we're seeing, which is exactly what we did. So we sat down and we sort of sketched out on Ewan's whiteboard, I remember, sort of what are the possible mechanisms that could describe this tear film thinning? The first and sort of the most talked about or perhaps studied through time was evaporation. So just the loss of aqueous into the atmosphere. Um, people tried to measure that, albeit indirectly, through years. So that's one mechanism. A second me mechanism would be tangential flow. So you don't lose any of the actual aqueous. It just flows parallel to the surface and disperses itself, kind of like beating, on a, beating of water on a wax car. The third would be maybe, possibly, you could lose some of the aqueous tears to flow into the contact lens or flow into the epithelium. Uh, and so we set out to investigate these things and try to understand if we could um, narrow down what is the evidence or what, what is the mechanism of um, tear film thinning. The first thing we did was we looked using an imaging interferometer to, to look at tangential flow. You can see when this eye blinks, which it will in a second, the tears will flow up. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, maybe I have to hit play again, but they'll, they'll flow up for about two seconds, which is what you can see plotted here. And then there'll be this slow drift where there's not very, mu very much tangential flow after that. We can also measure or look at sort of the tangential flow versus flow into the epithelium. So um, as I said, you get about two seconds of upward drift after the blink. This is the first two seconds here. And you can see actually for precorneal or pre-lens tear film, a linear rate of decay otherwise, not this sort of sloped um, decay that's very, very slow. Um, so that's another line of evidence against tangential flow. It's very linear, not this sort of exponential um, flow that you see. And evidence against the flow into the epithelium in the cornea is we could measure the thickness of the epithelium or the cornea during the interblink interval. So we could tell you if the epithelium was thickening or contact lens was thickening, and it, they weren't. So these are some lines of evidence against tangential flow and flow into the epithelium or the contact lens. What about evidence for evaporation? Well, I'm gonna take a little detour in the story here, and I'm gonna come back to this because some of the other story I'm gonna tell will help describe where we go with evaporation in the future. So this is uh, sort of 2003 to five era, uh, and I was fortunate, very fortunate, to receive a K23 Physician Scientist Award during this time. And this is where we started to pursue what was happening with contact lenses and dry. In particular, we had worked with another T35 summer student, Corey Ziegler here and Mitchell, and looked at, as others did, sort of with contact lenses versus uh, spectacle wearers versus emetropes, how do patients describe their experience? In particular, um, sort of do they self-report dry disease? And in this study, you can see that contact lens wearers were over 12 times more likely than clinical emetropes of the reference group here to say that they had dry eye 
they were more than five times as likely in spectacle wearers um, to say, contact lens wearers were, to say that they had dry eye um, against the spectacle lens wearing group. And this sort of drove the question of what's going on here, um, mechanistically or otherwise. And I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I, I put them here to show just what a productive and fruitful time in my career that was to have a K23, to have protected time to do these studies and really chip away at what was happening with um, contact lenses and dry eye. So I'm very grateful to those, the, the NEI and those here that supported me in my pursuit of that, uh, probably the most fruitful time in my career from a scholarship standpoint. Coming back to um, uh, what's going on then with the contact lens wear in, in the kind of penultimate study that we did or a publication that we did, it, we really found that what was happening was with the use of high water content, soft contact lenses, we would see sort of a spoiling. They were more attractive to um, hydrophilic lipids, surfactant type lipids that were in the tears. That coats the lens surface leads to a reduction in the lipid layer thickness over a contact lens. This video doesn't want to work, but it was a video showing rapid pre-lens tear film thinning. It was basically just gone. It wasn't upward drift. It would just evaporate, coming back to evaporation. And increase in evaporation leads to at least to increase in osmolality. We showed all of those things in the study definitively. And so um, I want to come back then because I just mentioned evaporation and particularly evaporation over a contact lens. Come back from my detour. This is the model. So the three potential mechanisms we showed, it wasn't tangential flow. It wasn't flow across the contact lens or the epithelium. And so let's, how did we sort of sort out the evaporation aspect of what was happening with tear film thinning? I'll show you a fairly simple experiment. What we had subjects do is either measure their, their tear film thinning in an open air state, or we put a goggle, goggles over their eyes. Goggles would basically increase the um, humidity to near 100%, so it would eliminate any potential for an evaporative mechanism to happen. And so when we did that, you can see that th particularly the thinning rate, thickness didn't matter, but this sort of free air was, these are pre-corneal tear foams, so about 3.22 microns per minute. But when we put the goggles on the eye, it effectively wiped out uh, pre-corneal tear foam thinning. So we think this really is sort of the heart of the evidence for evaporation driving pre-corneal tear film thinning that we measure through OCT or interferometry. However, the plot thickens. For years, since 1960s, it had been described that the lipid layer over the tears, it modulates or it reduces evaporative flow it's been really, really difficult to study. I think Maurice and Mishima in the early 60s tried to put like a little cysteine over the lipid layer to wipe it out and measure evaporation. A lot of indirect ways to do it. But um, so we were able to um, work on a system that measured not only the lipid layer thickness, but also this evaporation rate or pre-corneal pre tear film thinning itself. And the oddity is that when you plot, you'd expect if thickness of the lipid layer does modulate precorneal tear film thinning or evaporation, you should see perhaps a linear where you have increased thickness of the lipid layer, you have reduced evaporation. But that's not what you necessarily see. In fact, you see some outliers where you have got somebody here who's got a really normal lipid layer thickness, maybe 30 microns, 30 or 40 microns, but yet they've got the highest rate of evaporation. Likewise, you've got somebody with a thick lipid layer here, relatively thick, and sort of a, a moderate uh, 10, you know, again, sort of the average is three to four microns per minute. And so we started, we're like, well, what's going on here? Why isn't, isn't thickness of the lipid layer what should be modulating the evaporation rate? So evaporation, to summarize to this point, evaporation is the main mechanism of tear film thinning. The lipid layer is thought to mediate the tear film tear film evaporation. The lipid layer comes from the mybum of the meibomian glands. And it seems that thickness sometimes matters, thickness of the lipid layer, and not always. So the next step were to understand the structure, function, pathophysiology of the meibomian glands and, and the meibum itself to understand if we can kind of link these things together, in particular, the biochemical composition of the meibum and how it relates. This is newer work. This was an R01 that completed uh, two years ago at UAB. Um, we developed a system that was an integrated OCT. It was an ultra high resolution OCT, so it could measure thickness maybe about a half micron thick. 
that can measure thinning rates and combined it with a thickness dependent fringe um, sort of a top topography of the lipid layer system. Um, we co-registered the system. So the image to the left is the, the lipid layer. It's like a topography of the lipid layer. And then this is your OCT image here. And you can see these on this precorneal tear film. Um, and so they're co-registered. So the dotted line here is this sort of cross section that you're seeing here. The first thing we did um, after years of trying this, I think Kelly tried in an R01 that she had here, Ewan tried in an R01 that he had here, was we always had trouble sort of, the obvious thing is to say, well, okay, you can show me the, what precorneal tear film thinning is and isn't, but what about in the disease, disease state? You would expect to have higher evaporation and dry eye. And we always struggled with that across studies. And I think the reason is because over that period of time from the first dues workshop to the last dues workshop, we learned a ton about classifying the disease. Stuff that we knew early on from 1990s, it's just evaporative versus aqueous, that's not good enough. And so Kelly's gonna talk specifically about all the knowledge we learned about how we classify these diseases. I was fortunate to benefit from her experience in this R01 as it relates to really classifying the disease such that we're finally able to sort of capture what was happening mechanistically with the tears. So the main, the main comparisons in this graph to start were, can, can we show that precorneal tear film diff, thinning differs across disease states? So you've got normals, mixed disease, which is kind of a garbage group. It has aqueous deficient, lid disease, blepharitis, MGD, not a great group. These are the real groups we were after, the asymptomatic MGD subjects and then the outright MGD subjects. So these are, you can see graphically, different, different, different your normals, MGD, asymptomatic, and the mixed disease, which are kind of, you can see here's the precorneal tear film thinning rates. You're not quite doubled in MGD, substantially higher here. So we were finally able to show that, yeah, in, in MGD in particular, where you'd expect an altered lipid layer, that you've got an increased evaporation rate through precorneal tear film thinning. However, if you look at the next line down, we also, as I said, could measure tear film lipid layer thickness simultaneously. You don't see anything there, kind of like before. The thickness doesn't seem to matter as it relates to the trend you're seeing with the precorneal tear film thinning. So you somewhere between 58 and 62 nanometers thickness, but it, it didn't matter. It wasn't significant across groups. And so that leads to the question of why. Going back a couple of years, sort of the, the traditional model of the tear film was that it was a three layer system, an outer lipid layer, aqueous, and then mucins. More recently, it's a two-layer model, outer lipid layer with aqueous sort of mucin gradient against the uh, corneal epithelium. And the thinking has changed about the structure of the lipid layer itself. It used to be thought that there was a hydrophobic outer lipid layer, which is wax esters and cholesterol esters, still think that. But now, um, rather than there being phospholipids that interface between the aqueous and the hydrophobic lipids, it's these oacyl omega hydroxy fatty acids that have come onto the scene. In fact, um, people had been up and through about maybe 2015, 14, really sort of turning on the phospholipids. People are having a hard time finding them in my, my them anymore using advanced analytical techniques. You can see them in the aqueous tiers. So the field changed and pivoted and said, we don't think that they're actually phospholipids are part of the mybum. We think they're just cellular debris from epithelial cell membranes that are now floating in the tiers, but they're not really there on purpose. What we are seeing are these OAFA lipids. This is an example of an OAFA here um, with two double bonds and 18, this is 18, the fatty acid carbon chain. This is the hydroxyl fatty acid carbon chain here. These are strong surfactants and we're actually seeing them quite a bit in MIBOM. This is where the field was going at that time. And so in the context of this R01 with the OCT stuff I just showed you, we also, we also developed methods to look at these in human tears and MIBOM. This was a innovative techniques and technology paper that was in the ocular surface. And in it, we developed a method that we could do this direct infusion mass spectrometry to detect them, but we could also quantify them uh, compared to other lipid classes in a relative sense, um, rather than kind of old school trying to weigh them or determine like how much did you collect and then weigh it and then determine volume concentration. So this was a huge advance for us moving forward. So we're able to quantitate both in MIBOM and TIERS um, individual samples 
um, these uh, OASL omega fatty acids. So we took that method and we said across these disease groups, what can we show? This was a more of a descriptive paper where we showed in Meibel and Tears, there were 76 and 78 unique OAFAs identified. So these are individual species making up the class of lipids. Again, it's descriptive paper. So we looked for kind of the most frequent and abundant, um, abundant OAFAs, 18.2, 18.1, 18.1. Uh, and in both Meibel and Tears, all five OAFAs except this one were reduced in MGD compared to normal. So this sort of takes us into the land of now we're comparing the concentrations, if you will, of these OAFAs across disease groups. But how do you bring it all together? So there's disease groups, there's evaporation, precorneal tear film thinning, and then your, your biochemistry. Um, and that was this paper, sort of the penultimate paper of, of this R01, um, where we looked to say, we sort of classified them. We did a principal components analysis because of the massive amount of data, which took us down to the first PC loadings. And there were 10 on that. And of the six OAFAs that loaded, uh, or of the 10, six had negative correlations with precorneal tear film thinning, which means if you increase in their concentration, the rate of precorneal tear film thinning was gonna go down. But when, so, so really we're kind of looking at individual species level biomarkers here. If you change these, you know, change of molecules here, it's not enough to, to change the thickness. So we really changed the story to say that it's not about thickness so much more, it's about the composition of what's there that drives uh, evaporative uh, tear film thinning and therefore disease. Phew, that was a lot, long story. I think it's a good time to turn it over to my partner in CounterPoint and let her tell a bit of her story. See how nice I am. All right. So I took a little bit of a different approach um, than Jason did. Still a walk down memory lane and it's nice to see faces that we worked with with all this time. It brings back memories of funny things and I'll tell a little bit of that when I get there, but I'm gonna tell the story a bit about dry eye and then I'm woven into it because that's been what I've been looking at my whole career pretty much as some element of dry eye. And so from the beginning of where, so well first, I'll just say thanks to my partner in crime. Look at that young Jeff and that young Jason. Um, I know, no, so, so skinny. Um, and not gray and all that good stuff. But then in we've been married for almost 25 years. So 25 years this June, this picture here was uh, 20 years when we went to Ecuador. And so swinging over the edge of the world there, looking down um, over Ecuador essentially was a really amazing. I love that picture. And hopefully we'll have 20 and 25 many more years together. So... We've gone a lot of places. Um, we like to travel. So we fortunately in this field, you can go to an international meeting and get a little travel in at the same time. Um, Jeff mentioned we have a lot of de degrees. I think Jason beats me out because he's a double diplomat. So I don't only have one diplomat, so he wins. Um, and I think that we've had the good fortune to do lots of studies together, something separate. We used to always say that uh, he did contact lenses and I did dry eye. And as you just saw, they sort of went like this at some point. And so we've worked together on some things and then something separate. Um, but all in all, I think we both have a lot of passion for the anterior segment and the tear film. Um, I throw up here what I call a table of eight. So Bernie Dolan, when he was academy president, he wrote a, um, a column. It's what's the column called, Jeff? I guess you're going to, yeah, president's calling. And he said, you should have a table of eight. These could be eight people that were important or impactful in your life. And most importantly about your table of eight, you should tell them that they're in your table of eight while you can still tell them that they're your, your mentors and that you really admire and appreciate and look up to the things that they've helped you achieve. And I thought, well, that's a really good idea. How do I start to come up with my table of eight? Well, certainly Bernie Dolan was that. I, I did a lot of work with him early on at the San Francisco VA. And he's, you know, you all know, he's just a wonderful human and would give advice to anybody who needs it for anything. Uh, Tony Adams, and I just, I found that picture and I thought, oh, what a sweet picture of Tony. And he really, when I was an optometry student, he would take the time to talk to you about research or anything else. I think a lot of people share, probably many of you in this room share those same feelings about Tony. Bob Prouty was my residency supervisor and at Omni in Denver and 
Ash taught me how to be an expert clinician, which I thought was really fun. And we were doing a lot of dry eye. And at that time, I didn't really think of it as being something I would carry throughout my career. At that time, you could do punctal plugs. And so we would race to see who could put them in fastest. Because in Denver, we saw them all, we saw so many patients with dry eye. And that was the only thing you could really do except artificial tears. Of course, Carla, you know, you set me off on this path. I remember you saying, well, you don't want to do, what was it, uh, pediatric uh, congenital cataracts? No. <laughs> no, I tried. I really did. But no, that wasn't going to work. But then you introduced me to lots of people, and we'll get onto that in a minute, who really made a big difference. I, I remember you saying, I can teach you how to do clinical research, but you should pick something salient to optometry. And I still really feel that's important. That's advice that I give students who are looking at research careers today, because if you pick something that you really care about, and it's something that optometrists can do, I think it really can be impactful. Earl the Pearl, of course, and he gave us the opportunity to work with Brian Holden at University of New South Wales, learned so much there. Um, Pam Benoit is my, uh, my most recent provost, and she, to me, is sort of the gold standard of what academic administrative leadership should look like. Um, learned so much from her. And then I left last uh, Donald Korb, who I have eternal crush on. I mean, he's just, I remember one of my very, very first uh, presentations, I answered the questions after giving the presentation at the Academy. And Carly, you came up to me afterwards and you said, you handled Donald Korb's questions really well. And I was like, that was Donald Korb. I mean, I was so green. I had no idea. And he's just done so much for the field, in particular with MGD that, I'll, you know, I'll always, we have like, I hopefully a mutual fan club towards one another. He's a really special human too. So to start out with dry eye though, um, back in 1993 was when the first uh, group got together to do what I'd call a dry eye workshop. And it resulted in the NEI clinical industry, clinical trials on dry eye paper that was 22 pages long. And there you see me holding it. Joe's not here, but Joe would say, that's my Cleo journal issue. Um, you know how you'd be in somebody's office, you'd be like one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, what happened to six? There you go. I had, I had it. I kept it. I still have it today. The photocopy I made when I was in my residency and I had just kept it. So those are originals from way back when. And I, I liked dry them, but I didn't really realize it was going to be my thing. But that group actually started out the whole, they started the dry eye as we know it today. They came up with the first definition of dry. And there were two optometrists, three, two, two optometrists, Barbara Caffrey and Charles McMonies, who were part of that original workshop. All the rest were MDs, um, PhDs, and it was published. It was uh, chaired by Mike Lemp and published in Clayo Journal. And I asked him why in Clayo J, because it wasn't midlined at the time. And he said, because they agreed to do it fast. And I wanted it to get it out there to the public. And now you can find it on midline. So nobody really knows how many times it's truly been cited. I'm sure it's a lot because it was a fundamental paper in dry eye. <clears throat> then in 2003, finally, the first therapeutic with restasis by Allergan was, was approved. And that actually was a bit of a game changer because now there was something to try targeting inflammation. But this is its actual PI statement. It wasn't to treat dry eye. It was to treat to increase tear production in patients whose tear production is, pre is presumed to be suppressed due to ocular inflammation associated with keratoconjunctivitis keratoco sicca. And at the time, KCS was what dry eye was thought to be a more severe sort of aqueous deficient dry eye, not at all talking so much about the meibomian glands. And so that was sort of the baseline where everything was back in the beginning and when I sort of found that paper. I also tell students who are looking for projects, find a paper that's really meaningful to you because there's a roadmap in there that you can find to take you through lots of research in your career. Look at all of the, the people who have been referenced in that paper because they can tell a big story about that particular disease state that you like and it can provide a lot of information going forward as it did for me. So from 2003 to 2023, there's been a lot of changes. And I know this is super small font because there's so many different changes. At the bottom there, you see a list of all the therapeutics that have been approved for ocular surface and or dry eye. Nowadays, you go through the process of getting something approved for the signs and symptoms of dry eye, and you repeat that in two FDA clinical trials in order to get approval. So these are the winners here. Um, there have been losers. I've been a lot involved in a lots of clinical research, and I've been with companies through phase one, phase two, where then they, they didn't have enough information or enough to go forward. And as Jason mentioned, why is that? Well, I think that some of those early trials, we just were putting anybody in them, 
we didn't know what we were really doing. And if we did those studies over today, we actually might have approvals in a different way than we did then. Um, I also think there was a lot of misdiagnoses. So like when you look at neurotrophic keratitis today, how many really severe dry patients did I misdiagnose because I didn't check corneal sensitivity? So there's a lot of things that we know now clinically that I think really you know, do, do come into the design of clinical trials that have made what you see here you know, possible to happen. And I've had, of all those listed there, I've had opportunity to work on ground floor with many of these companies when they were just starting up in phase one or two and help them with study design. So you'll see towards the end, I've been fortunate to be on papers with some really impressive people who helped to you know, really get these over the finish line into the hands of docs who could use them to take care of patients. And that's been actually really rewarding to me to see that now there's tools in the toolbox. There's actually a toolbox and there's things in it that have helped patients. Largely, that's come through a lot of the TFOS workshops. So that first paper in 1995 then turned into a whole bunch of series of papers, white papers, through the Tear Film Inocular Surface Society, which have helped redefine and read the new definitions and the new classification systems to help us get there. And there's even one that's going to be published, a new DUS-3 that's ongoing right now that will be published in the next year or two. So here's the conclusions of that 1995 paper. And you'll see I've highlighted some things and over the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about those highlighted things. This was sort of where they said, this is what I call the roadmap. You know? So it said that clinical findings do not correlate with each other. It was thought that, but it had never really been shown. There weren't any validated symptom surveys for ocular surface disease. There wasn't any standardization in diagnostic testing. So how do you do a clinical trial when everybody's doing something different? Um, probably tear proteins were going to help us understand maybe some differences between the types of dry eye and certainly classification, as Jason mentioned, was going to be something that continues to help as we move forward in subcategorizing patients so that we could do trials better. Back then, they called it aqueous adequate and aqueous inadequate. And I think, oh gosh, how far we've come. We don't, we don't really use those words anymore. And I would say those six ODs that are listed there were who Carly introduced me to. Um, and I worked with them closely in so many projects. And in addition to working with Lisa and Lynn here, and I'll just kind of stop and say, if you don't have a good statistician or a team working, I mean, that's something that OSU has and always has had that I think makes a big difference in how research, especially clinical research goes forward. So I'll thank you, Lisa and, and Lynn, for all your work on these projects. So dogma. Um, clinical findings don't correlate with each other, and signs and symptoms don't correlate with each other. And then the repeatability of dry signs and symptoms is relatively poor. And these are some of my earliest papers. The lack of association between signs and symptoms in patients with dry disease is my most cited first author paper still today. And it was, almost didn't get published because it was a negative finding. And it went through like three or four rounds of review. And then finally, the, um, the editor contacted me and said, I really want to publish this because I think it's going to be highly cited. And sure enough, it, it was. And it's, these were things that people kind of thought they knew but had never seen written on paper. And so it was kind of nice just to start out that way. Almost didn't get the repeatability of clinical measurements of dry eye published either. I don't know if you remember that, Carla. We had to switch journals because after four times with the first journal, they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna do it. They wanted a normal comparative group and it was just dry patients. And so there you go. Sometimes you have to move to another journal. Surveys, this was probably the most fun part of my early career because I got to work with Carolyn Begley, Robin Chalmers. Barbara Caffrey, and we started to design a dry survey from scratch. Today, you all know it as the CLDEQ-8 and the DEQ-5. And more recently, I would say um, probably Robin pushed to have it, probably with Lynn, pushed to having it made into a more validated and accepted DEQ-5, really easy to use. And you'll see when we get to some of the TFOS do stuff that it actually is one of the recommended surveys to be used because it's been validated enough in the literature. So, you know, I remember when um, with this repeatability and validity of McMoney's dry index, I remember the first time talking to Charles McMoney's and being petrified that he was going to be mad about this, that it was, you know, that maybe it was critical of his work. And he was so excited that actually it gave it some validity. And so it kind of goes to show you don't be afraid of the people whose work you're actually working with. Go talk to them. 
And diagnostic testing has been a big part of my career, trying to figure out how to sort of normalize the way people do things in terms of in clinical trials in particular, but we've done a lot of this. Um, osmolarity testing was new uh, midway through sort of, in the, well, I guess in the earlier part of, uh, let's see, 2010. It had been around and now there was an instrument that you could do in clinical care. We had a system that was kind of big and bulky and had been Wow, it was hard to use a freezing point depression system and anything you're doing with a small tier sample really does uh, take some effort and work. So the osmolarity testing that Ben Sullivan designed, the tier lab, was sort of groundbreaking at its time. And it did show that as a single diagnostic test, it was better than all of the others, but still yet you had to do more diagnostic tests together to come up with a diagnosis, likely because there are so many different kinds of dry eye. So you're picking up different kinds of dry eye with different tests. There's still no single gold standard diagnostic test. And there's still no single test that you can do that will track a treatment and improvement with treatment either. So we still have lots of work to do. Recently, this bottom paper here, I worked with Allergan a number of years ago when they were still Allergan and they had all this data we were trying, they were trying to develop um, some outcome measures to do clinical trial and MGD specifically, and then they just dropped it like companies sometimes do. But they dug up all this data and its pictures and its expression and its samples, and they've been going through some publications. There's a survey. And so we've been doing sort of digging some stuff back up and coming up with some interesting things. For example, and this is still blowing my mind, when you look, and I don't, let me see, I do have a picture. I'll, I'll tell you that when we get to the picture, because it's maybe easier to explain. So protein. So I don't know who set it up, Carla. When me, I don't remember how it happened, but we were in a big room and it was ophthalmology here and optometry here. Everyone was introducing themselves and saying what their research was and what they needed. And I said, I need someone who can take a small sample and analyze the lipids. And somebody came up to me afterwards and says, you need to meet Kari Greenchurch. She's in chemistry and she does a, a she runs a core where they do proteomics and maybe she could do your lipidomics. <clears throat> Led to a long relationship with, you know, with her. Um, she has done some protein work with us uh, and continues to. So I actually called her earlier this week and hopefully, and I'll show you how we get there in a minute. But we did some microarrays and I haven't done a whole lot of work with proteins, but it was one of the indicators that people thought. There's a lot of people who have done cytokine work, a lot of therapeutics that have been directed towards certain cytokines, um, a lot of failures in that arena relative to drugs that never really have panned out because there's probably such a difference in certain types of dry patients and how, much, uh, how many inflammatory type of mediators there are. Oh yeah, I don't want to do that. Okay. So back then, Kari um, did first step with proteins in the tear film. Can, are they there and how many are there? And found 97 unique proteins. So you could do it was sort of the answer in looking at proteins in the tear film. And if you use different techniques of collecting tears, whether it be Shermer strips or capillary tears, you were going to get different results. And so therefore, again, one more reason why you might see differing results. Also, the instrumentation in which you use and the sensitivity in which you use techniques there also make a big difference too. And protein work is very, very, very expensive. Back then, a single sample probably wasn't adequate. You had to pool samples in order to be able to get a signal. And today she says that things are much more advanced, but still it's difficult. You have to really know what you're looking for. You can't just do a kind of a shotgun approach. You have to know what you're looking for before you start. But this was the first step in the right direction. There weren't a lot of people doing protein work and hopefully there have been more since. You see that there are a couple of stars there on the keratins. This is my current area of interest. The, in my Bohmian gland dysfunction, the duct basically gets blocked. And when it gets blocked, there could be because it's skin cells, keratins and other things. And so I get asked routinely in the MGD world, well, what's causing the blockage and is there anything that could fix that? And I said, well, we did one with some little work on protein, proteins and tears and proteins in my bum, and we do see some keratins. They're like, what, what keratins did you see? So now, you know, I've kind of been rethinking what we should be looking for. The, you know, the keratins could be interesting. These are, there's lots of keratins in the body and what they do is yet still unknown, but interesting. We did this little project to see if you could look at protein in mybum. So we pulled samples of mybum because it's teeny tiny samples. And we just were trying to see what would happen. And so we did the normal separation. And usually in the upper phase, that's the sort of the water phase is where you should see the proteins. And in the lower phase, the lipid phase is where you should see 
um, basically just the lipids, but we actually found out that's not really what happens. There's proteins down there in the lower phase too. And again, we saw some differences between the normal and the dry patients, but we were also, we found 10 plus keratins, and that's where I don't know what they are. I know that data is in some drive somewhere in the cloud somewhere. You know, Kari doesn't have it, I can't find it, so we're thinking about redoing this project over again to see what we can find in the keratins. It's not gonna move. Maybe it'll move. really want you to stay on the, oh, there we go. So moving on to the Tearful Monocular Surface Society, I guess because I was so influenced by that original paper, I wanted to be involved in this group who was making these white papers. And so of all of them over time, I've had the fortune of being part of them. So I guess this is the good luck part of the presentation. You meet people who have the same passion as you from all over the world who are doing great work, and that leads to more great work from lots of people because it takes a village. But many of these people have been lifelong friends. And again, there's a, a TFOS do lifestyle impact that was published about a year ago. So I don't have that picture up here. And then there's a new one that again will be coming out in 2025. And so it continues yet today. And I hope that inspires just as many people on the other end and people picking up research in this area. I'm trying, there we go. So the two definitions, um, they've changed over time. Most importantly, in 2017, dry was defined as a disease. That was the first, it was a disorder before that. That then led for it to have different ICD-9 codes. It could be billed differently. It could be recognized. You could start to have, you know, therapies. And after 2017, certainly in 2016, another therapeutic was approved. So there was two. 2003 to 2016 was a huge gap of time where nothing, a well, lot's happened, but nothing was approved. And so I think we move forward. The definition today um, is, it's probably gonna be revised slightly a little bit in the next round, but only a little bit. So if you, this is gonna tell you a little bit about the impact of these reports. So this is the citations of, for all of the papers that are part of this packet. So each one of those uh, in this whole report, each one of those um, where you see the numbers is an individual paper. If you take all of those papers together, you get this citation index here. So they were published in 2007. And I shouldn't have done it as a line like this. I should have just done it as individual bars because it's how many times it was cited in that particular year. So for example, in 2017, when, when the next report came out, it was being cited about 600 times. That's a lot of citations you know, combined. And this docu, this was, as you can see, over 200 pages long, where I remind you that the first one was 22 pages long. So a lot happened in that time period. Likewise, in 2017, it start, I start here in 2017 going to now to give its impact. This is a summary of all those papers put together, been cited over 2,000 times, um, up almost to 1,000 times in, in 2023 alone. So considerable impact of these. I mean, they're kind of probably if you omit citing them in a dry paper, you're probably going to get called on by a reviewer, I would guess. Jason mentioned the classification. So prior to this, I told you there was the aqueous adequate and the aqueous inadequate. And then it turned into aqueous deficient and evaporative dry eye. Nary the two shall meet in the middle. People really talked about them separately. But if you went back and looked at the original report, they actually did say that they could occur together. It's just the picture showed them separately and the picture lived. The words didn't. So the importance of a figure is really critical there because they really did recognize that it was almost how it's drawn here, that you have aqueous deficient, you have evaporative, and then you have the stuff in the middle where you have some elements of aqueous and maybe they're almost normal, maybe not in the MGD and they overlap one another. So this is a contribution. I actually drew this diagram so that I felt like this bottom part here was my contribution to the change of knowing what dry is today. And that's at least where you start to work with it. But that then made more questions about, well, what is MGD? So this was the beginning of the TFOS MGD report. What you see in the red box is how my Bohmian gland dysfunction was described in the 2007 report. And I don't know about you, but none of those things make any sense to me. How you can go from what even frequent means to trichiasis and symblepharon, I'm not really sure. Uh, seems like there's a lot of things that could happen in between there. So 
So we thought, well, this needs this box needs to be you know blown up. We need to know a little bit more about it. This then um, started the process of getting funding for it. I got a chance to work with Mike Lemp, who you know was also a hero uh, on this paper, and we asked if if doctors, so the graph there is if doctors felt, they were ODs and MDs together, if they felt that MGD was the most common cause of evaporative dry eye, and you can see a large bulk of people agreed or strongly agreed. But there's still some doubters there that didn't maybe even think it even existed at the time. So we're still talking about only aqueous deficient in the minds of some people. And so we, we wanted to see, well, where can we go with this? So the MGD report, same thing, two-year process, people getting together, looking at the literature, evidence-based, publishing this series of reports to uh, talk about the meibomian gland. And this is where Don Korb, uh, I think, was really, really critical. He did so much work on MGD in the 80s that just either wasn't published or extremely overlooked because it was overshadowed by everything that was kind of happening with inflammation and aqueous deficiency at the time. And so all the work that he did there didn't really kind of come to the surface. It turns out he actually coined the phrase, there's a little argument about who, but I think it was him, about coined the phrase meibomian gland dysfunction in the late 80s. And, um, and certainly, you know, he has, his feelings and thoughts about the meibomian glands run deep. And uh, I think we have that in common. So if you look at the MGD reports and their impact, same thing, you know, six to 700 times a year. I don't know what's happening in 2023. People don't think it's cool anymore. I don't know. So it's lost some citations and I wouldn't say lost. It was still cited probably 500, 500 times in that, in that time frame. And this is the classification of meibomian gland dysfunction. I mentioned that we're looking at the keratins. Well, there's obstructive um, meibomian gland dysfunction, which is a meibomian gland disease. There are other meibomian gland diseases that exist. So when people say MGD, meibomian gland disease, ooh, it's still a pet peeve. It's like commas when people use commas wrong and you know how the punctuation stuff is. So the, when people say MGD is meibomian gland disease, it just, I just have to kind of, mm-hmm, yep. And so meibomian gland dysfunction, most commonly obstructive, it can be cicatricial or non-cicatricial. At the time, we didn't know all these things as secondary, you know, cause of primary or secondary, but in here somewhere and how it turns scarring or non-scarring has got to be something related to the keratins. What kinds of keratins are they? What is their purpose? Um, what's going on with them? And then a lot of times people always ask, well, is MGD dry? And I would say, yes, it is, because look down here at the bottom, it results in ocular surface disease, including dry. So MGD is dry eye. It's a type of, of dry eye. So I took a look at this to some degree to kind of in the postmenopausal women. And this graph is kind of confusing. It does bear out in other literature, but again, we use some definitions that were specific. So aqueous deficient dry eye and evaporative dry eye. And then there's this mixed group and that's people who don't fit in either category. And I do think we need to understand them more because if you look at how many of them there are and that it increases over time, it really does. We typically see that in aqueous deficient dry, it looks like it dips here. And I think it's, it has to do with just the sample. But if you look at it starting at age 30 and forward, you see aqueous deficient dry eye, I guess from your point of view, it goes up like this and then it plateaus out. There was good research by Wang and all, which she looked at a, a large, large population-based study and found of younger people too, and found that aqueous deficiency plateaus out. But MGD continues to increase and the mixed part does too. So dry eye continues to rise, and I think it largely continues to rise over age because of MGD. Now, some of that's to be understood because things do change with age, and there are some researchers who are doing a lot of work in that area. How much of it is age and how much of it is disease, I don't think we really can you know, weed out from one another yet. But needless to say, you do see it in younger people as early as like studies have now been looking at children, and you do see it, it continue to increase. So that behooves you to do preventative work early on, especially to treat patients who are young, because what are they going to look like when they're 80? As Jason mentioned, we did MIBUM analysis, and we didn't know how to do that at first. So here's just a listing of papers in which we've looked at that. This bottom paper here is kind of this new work with Allergan, AbbVie now, that is old work, but new work where we're looking at um, meibomian lipid composition. And actually, they're finding some interesting things that really back up Jason's work with OAFAs. And so it's good to see that using another technique, um, Doug Borchman and his team are sort of validating those results. 
So MGD today is still on the rise, but it is part of dry eye and contact lenses are a big part of that. When you look at the literature about what's been done or being done with MGD, it ranges across all kinds of things. There's new in-office treatments, which don't have a lot of research behind them yet. Um, there's, new, there's one therapeutic that actually is for the signs and symptoms of dry eye in patients with MGD. So it's a dry eye approved medication. Mybo by BNL. Really interesting because if you do interferometry on it, you can't find it in the tear film. You can't see, it doesn't have distinct fr you know, front and back side of it. So it's there somewhere doing something and who knows. So it will be interesting to continue to follow that over time. But there is not a therapeutic with an MGD indication, although there are several groups that are trying. Um, treatment wise, well, first you see, I do want to show you this right here. So in symptomatology, the DEQ5 is now accepted by, you know, basically the tear film monocular surface society as a good screening test, including the OSDI as well. And many would say the speed survey, if you like that or use that. And then there's a lot of information on osmolarity, ocular surface staining. And basically this is just to show you that now there's some agreement on how you do things and how you can do things in clinical trials in order to come up with a dry diagnosis. And in terms of treatment, I mentioned I've done a lot of stuff with a lot of different companies um, to get things approved, to check and see how they are. A lot of safety studies. Um, pretty much every company, more or less, that's done something in ocular surface have had a chance to work with. And hopefully we'll continue to. That actually is really rewarding to see, like I mentioned earlier, that, that there are new therapeutics that are that are going to come out, more tools in the toolbox. So to give you an idea of what's on the horizon, um, there's a couple that are in phase three right now. This selenium sulfide by Azura is interesting to me because it, ha it breaks down keratins. It breaks the disulfide bonds in keratins. They're the ones who asked me, well, what keratins are they? And I said, well, well, well can you tell me what keratins you think there are? Let's, let's try. So it'll be interesting to see. It, the clinical data looks good, but the why often follows the approval because you might as well get it approved. And then you can see in a phase four, like really how, you know, why it works. And there's, there's several that are in phase two, and there's several that are just starting out as well, not even, they're preclinical, not even two humans yet. So I would say in the next couple of years, we'll have a few more, which is good. So then it begs the question of, well, then what? How do you know what to use? I think that's one of the biggest areas that we're missing. Dry in general, if you look at from 1995, 358 publications to 2023, 2000 citations for dry, it's a field that really grew in that time period. And how do you know your disease has made it to the top? Well, there's a Facebook page for it. So there's 7,000 doctors that are part of OS Docs and you know, trying to get information from each other. There are practices that are dry only practices out there now, which is amazing to me. You go, you know, and I, I just really think it's great that so many people have embraced dry eye. So what do I think, I'll just go here. What do I think that we should be doing to look further though? I think outcome studies are done. The, the payers need help and understanding for what kinds of patients what sort of therapies should be used. It shouldn't be that you have to do all these step throughs and then get pre-authorizations in order to be able to use anyone. And maybe it's not even the one you want to use. So they don't know um, because there aren't any studies which are comparing these for certain subgroups of patients. So there does need to be a lot of work there just to help docs figure out what they need to prescribe for who and when. Certainly the impact of the environment and screen time is huge, kids, everybody else. Like, so what does that mean? How does that change your UEFAs or does it change your UEFAs or what do we need to do in order to fix that? And I think that quality of life and then improvements in quality of life with treatment needs to be explored as well because we know it's impacting quality of life. We know that people are suffering through, they aren't missing days of work, but they are missing quality work. So, and that can be shown like a looser loss of productivity in the work environment versus I'm just not going to go to work today. I mean, I'm sure some patients are so dry that they can't, but I'd like to see this repeated with treatments to see if that makes a difference. So we've learned a lot and I'm being generous here in the last 20 years. It's actually more than that, but in the last 20 years, and it's, it, there's so many people involved, mentors, colleagues, trainees, students, all of you in the room are supporting people are probably involved somehow, maybe even in dry research. And that all makes a difference to everybody moving forward. So I'm embedded in the study of, or in the sort of the history of dry eye, but there's so many other people that are there too that have been working on it and will continue to carry that torch into the future. And that's 
Again, here's some of my additional thank yous of team like Jason mentioned. More of Jason's team thank you. And there we go. All done. Good, no time for questions. Excellent. We do actually have a little bit of time for questions if anybody has any. And I know there was one online and the question was um, related to MGD and the best treatment for MGD today. And does it differ for kids, treatment of MGD for kids? Does that differ at all? You want to take that? Well, as I mentioned, I think they should be treated. You know, and it depends on what they look like. Um, you can start out with sort of the warm compress type, evaluate them for sort of dry eye, and then consider in office procedures if needed. Hopefully, I mean, it would be really cool if some of these therapeutics coming forward could result in, you know, open meibomian glands that would allow for more normal meibum, and maybe you could do that like getting your teeth cleaned, you know, something sort of preventative. But for right now, I think you have to evaluate how significant it is. Can you get mybum out of the glands? And if you can't, you should be doing some, probably some in-office treatment or IPL eventually or something like that. Perfect. Any other questions online? Any questions from the audience? Don? Is, is red light a thing for dry eye or is that uh, snake oil? <laughs> it's one of those areas where there's not a lot of research, but there is a little bit. It's sort of like akin to IPL, IPL being better. Um, some docs are doing that as a less cost alternative to IPL or if they don't have IPL in their office or they don't have anybody to refer to. So there's not a ton, ton of research on IPL and what IPL does either. But in general, I would say most folks think it does improve things, especially patients with rosacea. So I wouldn't totally throw it away, but... You may have noticed at the, at the beginning of the night, I introduced these two as great scientists and publication writers, <laughs> but I didn't um, introduce them as great presenters because I knew you'd get the opportunity to see them tell the evidence-based story of dry eye through their research. And I truly thank you for that great presentation. We really do appreciate it. But what I also didn't say is, and I didn't want to start the night, night off with tears, because I knew I would tear up, but I just want to say what great honor it is, honestly, to be able to reward friends for being such great presenters of science and for presenting so much great information for clinicians out there to be able to treat the patients in optometry. I really do think that that is very, very important. And um, I do um, also want to present you with two Fry medals. So one is for Jason. Can we do the hug part first? And Is one is for Kelly. Fun? I'm trying not to. <laughs> um, but uh, truly, congratulations and thank you. Um, you know, we started optometry school together, you before me, but um, we've been through optometry school together. We've been through graduate school together. <laughs> uh, young faculty members together. We've been um, at uh, various scientific meetings, trashing other people's science. Um, <laughs> a couple of us were dancing at the parties, but mostly we've been together <laughs> <laughs> through all the fun times, through all uh, all the challenging times. And um, there's certain people that we miss greatly. And I just want to thank you for all you've done for optometry.